Welcome to the Lean Blog Podcast. Visit our website at www.leanblog.org. Now, here's your host, Mark Graben. Hi, this is Mark Graben. Welcome to episode 238 of the podcast for January 11th, 2016. My episode today is a conversation with someone I've wanted to talk to for a long time, Kevin Cahill. He is executive director of the W. Edwards Deming Institute, and he's also a grandson of Dr. Deming himself. So Kevin played a very instrumental role in getting NBC to publicly release um, online the 1980 documentary, If Japan Can, Why Can't We?, um, the, the broadcast that helped introduce Dr. Deming to the Western world. Uh, so we talk about that in the podcast, uh, along with his recollections of watching the show when it originally aired, um, sitting there next to Dr. Deming. We'll also discuss Kevin's reflections on learning the Deming philosophy and his attempts um, to utilize the ideas in his career and how challenging that can be when it flies in the face of the prevailing business culture. But it's a really fun discussion. I hope you enjoy it. And if you have follow-up questions for Kevin, please uh, go to the blog and post a comment. Go to leanblog.org 238. And if you, want, if you haven't seen the video yet and if you want to uh, explore some other links, about Dr. Deming and the Institute, please go to the website. Again, leanblog.org 238. Well, Kevin, it's a pleasure to talk to you again, and, and thank you so much for joining us here on the podcast today. My pleasure, Mark. Looking forward to it. So, you know, we're going to be talking a lot about, um, you know, your grandfather and his work and his philosophy uh, in the podcast, but you know, I think it'd be really interesting for the listeners if you could introduce yourself. You know, what what have you done, uh, you know, professionally, and and uh, you know, if you know, Pierce, if any of that work was uh, influenced by um, by your grandfather. Sure, it was interesting because as I was growing up, I didn't really know much about my grandfather's work. I knew that he was involved in statistics. I knew he had a PhD. I knew he did a lot with math. And interestingly, for my brother and me, as we were growing up and um, and observing some of this, because my grandfather worked out of a small uh, office in his basement and he had a big chalkboard and we see all the mathematic figures. One of the things we always said was, man, that's something we never want to do in our life. Uh, working in math and working with numbers, that's got to be one of the most boring things that you could ever do. And so it was interesting that that was kind of our first impression of our grandfather and his work. Uh, and that that didn't change for a very long time until uh, until I was actually exposed to, to what he did. And when I was exposed to what he did, it had a big impact on me, but I was still in college, and it wasn't something that I could really do uh, or think about at that point from uh, from a work standpoint. But then when I ended up starting out in business, I was able to look at some of his ideas and think initially, well, I'm not in a management role. I'm not in a leadership role. I'm really starting out at the bottom. So there's nothing I can really do. And I remember being kind of frustrated about that. Uh, and as I read a little bit more about my grandfather and what he was doing, I realized, well, wait a second. I actually do have a small sphere of influence that maybe I can impact by looking at things differently, by by kind of doing these bare bones flow charts and understanding what the process is and see, well, wait a second, if I can bring some of these ideas without even mentioning my grandfather into the organization and see where could I make the biggest contribution and how could I, maybe then I could continue to use these further along. So that's what I did in the beginning was to take that approach. And what field or what, what types of business were you, were you starting your career in? It was, um, it was, a, it was a media rep firm business. And what they, it was a terrific company, Katz, K-A-T-Z Communications, Katz Media. And what they did was they represented TV stations, local TV stations around the country, and sold their advertising time on a national basis. So each television station has their own local TV, has their own local sales department. 
and they sell locally in that particular area. But, for example, if you have a TV station in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and Procter & Gamble wants to buy advertising time on Tulsa, that may not actually be placed in Tulsa. It may be placed in a different city. And so that's what we were doing was we were representing those stations on a national basis. So it was a pure sales organization. And in a pure sales organization like that, you know, one of the things that I saw was there was – you had sales assistants, which was what I was, and executives and managers, but oftentimes they had such specific roles that there was – uh, a lack of understanding between the salespeople and the assistants on what actual role the sales systems could could do and how they could perform to the best of the design that that they had been um, that the developers had designed for those. And so that's where I said, well, wait a second, maybe I can be of assistance in there if I can learn how these sales system work, learn how this can be better integrated throughout the in organization and make myself as useful and valuable as I possibly could. So then as, so it's interesting, you know, you talk about, you, you know, you're not a senior leader. You know, I think a lot of people, even in the context of, of the lean methodology, they learn about what their executives should be doing. But so I'm not an executive, I'm an engineer or I'm a doctor or, you know, so I think, you know, there's similar questions um, that people have. It sounds like, you were trying to figure out, well, you know, let's understand processes and systems. Let's understand quality to do what you could, at least within what, what you influenced at that early stage, right? Exactly. And like, we were, like I was just mentioning, that was one of the things that was frustrating was, do I even bother because I'm not a leader? And to me, that was one of the things, yes, if somebody from the top, as you know, Mark, as well as anybody out there, if you can get the people from the top – actually doing it, actually being behind the ideas, then you can, you can um, uh, change can be a lot faster, can be more powerful. But not having that in place, I, I definitely believe that, that somebody at any level does have some sphere of influence that they can impact you know, in an organization or in a community, even at a low level like I was starting out, by just thinking from a system standpoint, by looking at the organization differently than some of the other folks who maybe view it as a, um, you know, very segmented, very, you know, separate uh, roles and positions and responsibilities, rather than looking at it from a, from a perspective that, hey, if we blend some of these together, maybe we could do be more effective, efficient, and productive. Yeah. So you know, as, you know, Dr. Deming, you know, would have said, uh, you know, quality starts in the boardroom, and you yes. know, senior management is. Uh, you know, maybe most responsible for for the system. Um, how, how did your career progress uh, in, in in terms of you know getting in, in, into management or different types of leadership roles? Were you able to um, you know apply some of these ideas differently as you moved along? And I, and I was because as I started to take on those roles and take on those responsibilities and think about it a little bit differently, what it enabled me to do, and this is one of the things that I encourage people who may say, hey, I'm not in that leadership role, is that if you use some of these ideas and if you start to think systemically early on in your career, it's going to give you visibility and a different lens through which to look at the organization. And from my standpoint, it helped me move up faster in the organization than I would ever have been able to do. And it gave me the confidence to come up with ideas and proposals. So I moved very quickly um, from being an assistant to being a sales trainee and then into the account executive position where in each way, each step along the way, I assumed a greater and greater role and responsibility. Mm -hmm. And so those type of ideas and that type of thinking really helped me move up, not only me personally, but more importantly, the people around me and the organization as a whole, mm. you know, look at some things very differently, especially since I realized that the sales system and the whole design of it was really the focus of the organization, and there needed to be a greater understanding on how we could use that and how we could integrate it in with our television stations. Mm -hmm. So I started to move up in the organization and would go out and train TV stations and actually try to sell them on the system as well as doing my own, you know, my own role. 
And that led me to fortunately very quickly have the opportunity. Uh, my bosses believed in me and gave me the opportunity to move up to uh, Seattle to run uh, the regional office up there for the organization. And so now all of a sudden I actually had a management role. And that was when I thought, okay, now I can really start to use my grandfather's uh, philosophy to a greater uh, extent. Um, but it didn't work out that way, which is really interesting, Mark. I actually fell back into what was the prevailing style of management, and and that's something I've kind of examined later in life. Why why would I, when I use some of these ideas, start to fall back into you know what was uh, you know what everybody else was doing? Well, you know, I think you know we're we're all a part of a system, though, right? I mean, you know, yes. there's there's expectations of our, our leaders or uh, you know norms in, a, in, a, in an industry and organization you know I mean it, it, it can be hard to sort of buck the trends of that you know predominant management system if you say well you know we, we just to pick an issue uh, you know in particular you know we shouldn't we shouldn't rely on annual performance appraisals well you know somebody yeah. working in as someone working at GE you know 20 years ago would have found themselves very unpopular. <laughs> Even exactly. trying, even trying to challenge, you know, what had become so ingrained with the, you know, the rank and yank systems and things we could all grumble about. It's it's funny, you know, today here in in, in twenty fifteen, going into twenty sixteen, that GE is moving away from, uh -huh. you know, those practices. Um, you know, so you know, I think some of these ideas are just ahead of their time, or they're 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 good ideas that are hard for. Uh, hard to get others um, to even see because they might say, well, well, what's wrong with the annual performance review system? I mean, why would we get rid of it? Um, it, they, it can be tough. So I, I guess I would say, you know, to, well, you know, and, to be fair you to hit you, it right you, on, you hit it right on the head. The performance appraisal was one of the things that, that I was really challenged with. And when I went up to that Seattle office, we started growing tremendously. We started adding people. The money was pouring in. And what was happening was I started to have this false belief that it was because of me, mm. that I was the reason that, that, you know, here I'm this young manager. I think at the time I was the youngest manager in the company. And, wow, this office is taking off. It's, it's because of me. My performance appraisals are terrific. I love performance <laughs> appraisals. Mm -hmm. They were they were good performance appraisals, not because I had done anything special, but because the money had come in. And in sales organization, what are you going to be appraised on? How are your sales? Yeah. You know, so if I'm growing twenty, thirty percent a quarter in some cases, boy, I'm looked at as this is this guy's doing a great job. So it started to get to my head that performance appraisals, that some of the mechanisms that we had in place and the reasons we were doing so well was not because of the system or because of the inputs coming into it, whether those are chosen inputs or uh, it require, I mean, imposed inputs. It was, there was nothing that we could do to get out of the way of the money. Hmm. And so it was interesting, the first time I went to one of my grandfather's seminars was when I was a manager, and my mother had been pushing me to go. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I said, no, no, I don't need to go to that stuff. I don't really need it anymore because you know we're doing so well. And thank God she did because I went. And it's really funny. I remember, okay, I'm going to bone up on my grandfather's philosophy before I go to this <laughs> seminar mm -hmm. because I – I believe that he is wrong, and I'm going to prove it to him. Oh. <laughs> and so I went down there. I had a boatload of numbers, and I was showing him how our numbers had gone up, and I could show that in this case, when all of a sudden our sales dipped, I had a sales meeting and said, okay, you guys, it's not working out right now. I need everybody working harder. I need you guys in on the weekend. We need to get this up. We're dropping. Our year to year has gone down a little bit. And guess what would happen? They'd come in. They'd work on the weekend. They'd mumble and grumble. And then all of a sudden next week, the next month, the sales would go up. So I was reinforcing myself that because I was giving them a hard time and I was pushing them, that, that was what was, that's why the numbers were going up. And then when I didn't do that, guess what would happen? The numbers would go down. Well, so I'm starting to believe, you know, 
the prevailing style that, you know, that, that's what you do. So I went down to that seminar ready to challenge my grandfather that he was wrong on a number of these different things and that performance appraisals did work and some of this other stuff. And um, I remember walking into that room, and fortunately I kept my big mouth shut because there were about 600 other people in the room, and I was kind of in awe of all the people. Yeah. And uh, I kept quiet for that first day and was really chafing, listening to him talking, thinking, he's wrong on this, he's wrong on this. Well, you know, probably a lot of people in the room were thinking the same thing, because I've talked to people who were at yeah. these seminars, and a lot of the people that you know attending were sent there, as opposed to it being their own yes. personal choice, and that they were skeptics or people that would walk out. Um, yep. And I remember when we got into some of the first groups, talking to some of them, and I was kind of in the same boat. Yeah, I mean, he's wrong on this, and you know, in the evening session, and uh, it was pretty funny uh, because by the second day, fortunately, I never brought any of that stuff up. Well, I guess it's a, a, a different burden, uh, or you know, you have you know Cahill on your name tag instead of people yeah. to look and see, you know, uh, Deming. I said, well, but um, <laughs> you know, to be able to sort of share. Those reflections, you weren't, you probably weren't self-identifying as, oh, yeah, well, my grandfather's wrong. Or <laughs> exactly, I wasn't bringing that up. But by the second day, they kind of figured it out because my grandfather had called me up and he wanted to say hello to me while uh, I'm talking to him. And they're saying, how did you get to the front yeah. of the line? How do you know him? I goes, it's my grandfather. Uh, <laughs> Who's your grandfather? Why do you not believe some of this stuff? <laughs> yeah. So it was, it was pretty funny. But by the end of that second day. I'm telling you, Mark, I remember going back to the room that night, and it just it really shook me up mm. because I thought <laughs> I was wrong. Now, had you had opportunities to share or, you know, some of this with, with him privately, or he was, you know, was busy traveling the world and, uh, you know? No, I had, never, I had never had the opportunity to share it with him privately because the relationship that we had, and we knew him very, very well growing up, was he, he never talked business. He never talked what he was doing. And so you never, I never felt like my place was to challenge him on a performance appraisal or this number or that number, the way I was looking at things. Um, I just, it just was not something that we did when we got together as a family. Sure. I mean, you know, I, I don't, bother my family with uh, talking about patient safety problems and lean health care over, <laughs> over Thanksgiving dinner either, you know, so I understand. <laughs> um, they don't even creep in a little bit? No. I'll tell you, man, it's hard for me. Yeah. At well, you know, it's it, you're right. I mean, yeah, it does creep in sometimes. Yeah. But, yeah, it's just yeah. Um, but, you know, so you talk about, you know, your you know, relationship uh, with, with with your grandfather and 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 can you tell the story? Um, I've I've already heard you tell it, but for the listeners, can you tell the story about watching um, the NBC documentary "If Japan Can, Why Can't We"? That you that you got to watch it with him. Sure. Well, that kind of dovetails into what we were just talking about. You know, growing up, all I knew was like I had mentioned earlier about the mathematics and the background and the statistics, and we had spent so much time with them. That uh, that you know that's what we that's what we thought we knew, and uh, my family had moved in 1979 from Washington D.C. to California. Uh, my grandparents and I were very disappointed that we had left because we were very close to them, and I called my grandfather and grandmother and said. W between my freshman and sophomore year in college, I'd like to come back to D.C. So I, I had a job, summer job, already lined up, and uh, wanted to come back and, and see my high school friends and hang out and all that. And they had a extra room in their little house, and would I be okay? Would it be okay if I stayed there for the summer? And they were very nice about it. They said, sure, absolutely. So I get there, arrive in early June, and my mother gives me a call about a week, week and a half later, and says, you know, your grandfather's been to Japan a number of times, and they're going to feature him, mention him on a program called If Japan Can, Why Can't We? And I want to make sure that your grandfather has the opportunity with your grandmother, and my grandmother's sister also live there, uh, to watch this program. 
I said, sure, that'd be great. I mean, you can imagine your 20 year old kid, your grandfather is going to be mentioned on television. I mean, that was pretty exciting, yeah. you know, and, 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 15 this, minutes of fame type thing. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is not, you know, these days it would probably be on, you know, the National Geographic channel or something yeah. obscure. This was one of the major networks. Yeah. This was NBC. There were only three networks at the time, NBC, CBS and ABC. And, you know, there were a couple independent stations, but that was it. Yeah. And so they, she said, just make sure he watches it. So that night of June 24th, 1980, I went downstairs. My grandfather was working in his little office basement, and I said, you know, it's time to come up and watch the program. And I remember he wasn't too thrilled about it. Mm-hmm. He had so much work to do. But we went upstairs, and we all sat down on the sofa and started watching the program. And you can imagine my excitement when the program opens and my grandfather, um, you know, has a line. Yep. You know, what can we do to work smarter, not harder? It was something like that. And I just remember turning to him and being excited as heck that, wow, he's on TV. He was right in the beginning of the program. And, uh, and then nothing. So for the next quarter hour, there was no mention of him. And you could tell he was getting really, really fidgety. And then this Japanese man gets up in front uh, on the program, and he's in front of an audience, and he talks about how Americans are responsible for the Japanese economic miracle. I may have the words a little bit wrong, but it was at that time I opened my mouth for the first time and, and since the beginning, and I looked at my grandfather because I knew he'd been to Japan, and I asked him, I said, do you know any of those Americans? And then it was clear mm-hmm. with my grandfather coming on that he was one of those Americans. And it just, to this day, it shook me up because I remember looking at him saying, you, you, I mean, you are responsible for a lot of this? I had no idea. It was earth shattering to me. Yeah. And I just remember watching in stunned silence for the next four or five minutes while they talked, while my grandfather talked about these ideas. It was just stunning to me. Yeah. And then... It went on for a while with some other people. I was trying to regroup. I don't even think I remember kind of watching any of the next 45 minutes or so because I was just so in such awe of what he was doing. And then at the end, they really put the hammer down when they talked about National Corporation, and it came back to my grandfather yeah. in the last 15 minutes of the program. Yeah, and that's where you know he's he's featured quite heavily uh, in that that last segment. Um, exactly. Yeah. And so it was, it was, it was one of those things where you knew life was never going to be the same, but you weren't quite sure how it was going to be different. Mm-hmm. Um, and like I said, my grandfather works out of this little office, um, and he was hard of hearing, and so he used a speakerphone. And so I would come. My job was only sometimes four hours a day, and I would come home, and my grandmother. And my aunt and I would would stand at the top of the stairs of his office, and we'd open the door up real quietly, and we'd listen because he would speak on that speakerphone. And we would hear the titans of industry calling in and wanting to speak to my grandfather. And at the time, there was no Internet, so at times we weren't sure who those were. And so I would go in the next day to the law firm that I worked in, and they had, I think it was LexisNexis, and I could look up, okay, this guy is the CEO of this company, the president of this company. I'd come home and tell my grandmother who these people were, and we'd listen the next day. And it was astounding listening to some of those conversations that summer. It was really, really cool. Yeah, and uh, it, it really you know, it strikes me, you know, thinking back to earlier part of the story that um, – you sort of had to drag him out of his office to come watch the show. Yes. I think that, you know, uh, most most people, regardless of, of how, how humble you are, if, boy, if you're going to be on a major network show, you would be there <laughs> to watch it well, because it would be I exciting. Thought. And, and yeah. But yeah, I mean, he was, he, I guess, he, you know, he's that focused on his work. And, you know, from what you're describing, it doesn't sound like he's the, the type of grandfather who would sit around and tell stories about how important he is. You know, he was, you know, you know uh, too humble to do that, it seems. Never once did I hear him do that unless it was asked. I mean, and there were a couple times in my business career where I was at an impasse on how to handle a situation, and I would call him and, and, and ask him. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was always fascinating how what his responses were you know, in those situations. I always figured out the answer, but 
but he would never tell me directly what the answer was. He would ask me a couple of questions, and then he would point me to some areas. Sometimes I remember one time he he mentioned two numbers, and I couldn't figure out what that meant. And I said, well, what do those numbers mean? He said, those are page numbers in my books. <laughs> and so I went to the page numbers, and I'm reading it, and I'm thinking, wow, that's my answer right there. And uh, he didn't tell it to me. He let me figure that answer out. But, uh, yeah, no, he never never really talked about it, and it was, uh, it was, it was a pretty extraordinary summer, I can tell you. It was, it was quite... Uh, quite fascinating as a 20 year old kid to finally realize to realize that your grandfather had had such an impact on the world and you're thinking he's just this guy who hangs out and does some statistics and travels around Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i bet and then have the opportunity to be able to call and uh, pick his brain you know they say you know some some captain of industry and then another and then and then you and then back to another Another exactly. Or, yeah. Here I'm calling about some uh, small personnel issue that I have in my office about an assistant who we're struggling with, and I remember about to fire, and I thought I had done everything because this was after the seminar that I'd gone to, and after that 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 four day seminar that I was telling you about earlier, it really changed the way I started looking at my office and my people. But there were still times where I couldn't figure out, you know, how do you handle a certain situation. And I had one assistant who we couldn't figure out. How, she had to change the paper on the weekend for all these. You remember all those printed reports you would get, dot matrix printers, and I mean, there'd be stacks of paper. And she couldn't figure it out. And I finally, we finally had to put her on probation. HR said you got to put her on probation, which means you're going to be fired. And I, I called my grandfather, and I asked how he was doing. And I'll never forget because he was probably 92 at the time. And he answered the phone. I said, you know, I said, hi, how are you? He would always take my calls, which was so nice. Um, And he said, I'll never forget, he said, I'm desperate. And he knew he was running out of time. And I've kind of reflected on it for a long time. When he meant desperate, did did he realize that he was coming to the end of his life? And he was desperate to do as much as he could. And subsequently, as I thought about it and reflected on it, I, I thought he was I felt more like it was desperate that he knew he was having an impact, but he knew that it wasn't going fast enough as Mm -hmm. he would have liked. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine, you know, he he tells me this in this quiet voice, and he said, so, Kevin, what can I help you with? (laughs) I I felt terrible that I was going to take even a second of his time to ask about my assistant, you know? And uh, he insisted, though. Mm Mm-hmm. And he pointed me to those pages, and I figured it out. We figured out it had to do with how people learn differently. Mm-hmm. And here I was falling back into, this is how I learn, this is how I'm going to teach. And once we flow charted out the process for her, she never had another problem. Right. And I just remember thinking, I can't believe I spent his time doing that. But, again, I think he was one of these men that knew, if I could figure that out, who knows what that impact would have been would have had on that on that assistant? I right. mean, if we had fired her, I would. Ne- it's like he talked about the unknown and unmeasurable. I would never have known how that would have impacted the rest of her life, her possibility of getting job, her possibility of doing something else. And instead, she ended up leaving. I don't know a year or two later on her own volition and got into teaching. Mm-hmm. You know, if she had been fired, what what might that have done to her self worth and and so. To me, that was that was a great gift that he gave. Yeah, yeah. Well, and you know, it's it, it, what you say. It's interesting to think about you know the the human effect of um, if you will the the prevailing system of management even today. Um, you know, a lot of ways isn't different than uh, than 1980. And you know, I've seen studies, and you know, not to get too sidetracked on this, but you know, there's a lot of research and articles that talk about. Um, the, the the effect of workplace workplace stress and high pressure environments and um, low engagement to, to people's health to their physical yep. health and yes. you know there there's you know it's just uh, you know we see this in in healthcare the the, the cost uh, uh, you know the the way it flows through nurses being 
burned out, doctors being burned out, that has a bad effect on patients. I mean, those are things we're still uh, trying to figure out and improve today. And, well, and, you know, and I can imagine you must just see it. Uh, you hear the stories about these doctors who you know work twenty-four hour shifts and eighteen-hour shifts, and you know the impact on them. And you know the letter that you had forwarded to me that my grandfather I'd heard about it. But I hadn't seen the actual letter that that you sent me that my grandfather had written about his stay in the hospital, and it was pretty frightening. And and you know I don't know how I'm sure some of those things are different now, but it was pretty scary that at the time he wrote that letter that a lot of those things were happening. You know. Well, I think a lot of the same things happen today. I mean, you know, he was writing about you know a nurse saying they would do something, and then they were you know gone for 90 minutes. Well, you know they they get distracted. They they get pulled into all sorts of different things and then it's easy to forget. And, you know, I think a lot of this is, you know, a product of the system. Um, and, and, and that system doesn't always set people up for uh, success or, or for or quality or, or, you know, the right things for the patient. So a lot, a lot of that is, I mean, you know, as I read that from, I think it was 1987 yep. when he wrote that a lot of that, you know, it, it, it seems, you know, it's still pretty contemporary. Um, and that's where I think, you know, a lot of his work and lessons are really very, very timeless and relevant today. Um, but I, I want to ask you one other you know, thing about the program, um, the, uh, the NBC program of Japan Can, Why Can't We? Can you talk a little bit about the story and what was involved in um, getting that out on YouTube and, and, and having that be available? I had never seen the program because I, you know, I was a kid. I was seven years old when it aired, and it hasn't been available. And I've, I've sure looked for it. Um, you know, for, so for one, thank you for those efforts. But can you sort of talk about, you know, how sure. that how that came to be? Well, and I think part of it is, you know, NBC Universal was such a big company, and they had so many programs that they had archived. That I know Claire and Bob Mason, who uh, Claire Crawford Mason was the was the producer behind it. I know they had tried to get the rights to it over time, and they had never been able to make much headway as the rights, I guess, reverted back and forth between some different organizations and ended up with NBC Universal. And um, I was very fortunate that uh, my father had some connections at NBC and put me in contact with some people who were pretty high up at NBC, and, and I asked for their help. And they were very accommodating, saying, you know, this sounds like it should be out there. Let me tell you who you need to go and work with. And then finally I ended up working with a, a woman in uh, at, at NBC Universal in their archive department. I believe it's the archive department. And over a period of time, we worked out an arrangement because I explained what we were. We were not a for-profit organization. And I think that was one of their concerns at first, is a for-profit organization showing it. And once I explained who we were, Deming Institute, the background, all of that, it was just a matter of working out the negotiations to secure the rights. And what I explained to him was, I really didn't want to just have the rights to show it once. This was too valuable for people like you, Mark. You said you had never been able to find it or see it. I've talked to hundreds of people over time who said, I'd love to see it. I'd love to learn, you know, what, what it said and what was, you know, the impetus behind this this whole movement that started off with this program. So ultimately we worked out an arrangement with NBC Universal where they would grant us the perpetual rights to show the program on our YouTube channel, on our website so that people would have that opportunity. And fortunately, they were gracious enough to, you know, to work it out. And we had a donor who stepped up to, to cover the, the rights fee cost for the Institute. And so we, once we settled that, um, we were able to put it up. And we're just absolutely thrilled that, that we've had that opportunity to make that available because it's too valuable to sit in a vault and never be uh, um, shown to the public. And, and uh, again, thank you for, for making that available. And, you know, for anyone who, who hasn't seen that yet, um, I'll, I'll link to the video um, in, in the post blog post for this episode, or you, you can go to leanblog.org slash DemingNBC. That'll take you to a blog post um, that, that has a link to the video, or you can go to YouTube and uh, find the Deming Institute YouTube channel, or if you just search for 
uh, if Japan can, why can't we? Um, you'll you'll find the program. And you know, I'm just looking here. It's got uh, 3,500 views so far. I'm sure that's going to um, just grow over time. And, and it's interesting to see the comments here. There's I don't know if you've looked at this recently, yes, Kevin. But, they're you know, very people, very nice. Yeah, pe yeah, lots of lots of thank yous, and I haven't seen it in a long time. I, I watched I watched this with my uh, my father. Um, over Thanksgiving. So, okay, you're right. This, this did creep into <laughs> holiday family time. But uh, that's to, funny. <laughs> uh, we, we, we did not gather TV trays and turkey and the whole family around the TV. But, you know, you can watch YouTube through, uh, you know, TVs these days. And so, yeah, my dad and I sat and watched it because, my, you know, it, it's, thanks to, it's thanks to him that I heard about your grandfather because my dad attended one of his four-day um, seminars in the late 80s when he worked for Cadillac within General Motors and oh, I um, remember you had told me that. Isn't that great? Yeah, yeah. So um, and I he, think I think you said that you ended up reading uh, what was it Out of the Crisis or something during uh, summer. Yeah, it was uh, during a break from school. My dad had the book um, there at home in, in the bookshelf, and um, yeah, it was uh, I was glad to be introduced to that because you know I was I was like like sort of like you were describing. I was in college and. I had only had you know part-time jobs. I'd had you know good managers and bad managers, um, and uh, it was really interesting to read about the real-world workplace. And you know, I didn't know what I was about to get into, but you know, and I, I mean this you know in you know, a, you know, a positive, you know, respectful way. But I've said you know, being exposed to the Deming philosophy was in some ways the best thing that ever happened to me, and it was also <laughs> the worst thing. Because then it's frustrating when you go into an organization that doesn't practice this. And what, what set me up for frustration was that coming out of college, I had said, you know, I, I don't want to work for General Motors. I just didn't want to do that. But I did some interviews and, you know, you check into it. And I took a job at a plant in Livonia, Michigan, that very specifically was operating under what they or they said they were, what they called the Livonia philosophy, which was basically the Deming philosophy restated and they had a slightly different union contract and I thought this sounded great and so I, I took the job and I went in and I learned very quickly oh okay well there'd been you know that uh, a new plant manager a couple of years previously and ironically you know all the Deming stuff was was just a bunch of posters and slogans on the wall <laughs> oh, is it that ironic it huh? is yeah. it is but you know so in in some way you know it's just uh, you know if you if you don't you know if if you don't know any better, or you don't think to question some of these things, you can, you know, maybe, you know, I don't know how to say, you know, just go through your, your, your career not challenging things. But on the whole, I'm, I'm very thankful, and it served me well, you know, to, to have these ideas and to be able to try to apply them and, and to challenge things. So. Well, I was, always, I was always really fortunate, even though I tried, like I mentioned earlier about the sphere of influence, that I always had bosses above me, managers, who gave me enough rope, and when I would bring up an idea to them that was unique to the organization, that is, I, I think having my grandfather's philosophy influence me allowed me to lay it out in a manner that may have made it may have made them more receptive to it. Mm -hmm. But they had to have a lot of courage to give me some of the rope that they gave me, uh, you know, in my, especially when I was in uh, my Seattle office where I started a number of different training programs, things like that that hadn't been done outside of the home base in New York. And, you know, I think that's a big thing, too, if you can gain, you know, the respect to, uh, of some of those managers above you. A lot of times they will give you the rope to, to try some different things. And, and fortunately they did for me because, you know, that's what gave me the confidence to go out and, you know, go out on my own ultimately. Um, but, but it is, it is interesting how, you know, that, that does impact you. Yeah. So as, as, as we uh, start to wrap up here, um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, the Deming Institute and um, you, you know, a little bit about your role and, and what the Institute has been doing. It seems like there's been um, a lot more happening in uh, recent years, conferences and things through the website. So, you know, for people who haven't checked out the Institute, can you give a bit of an overview for the listeners? Sure. Um, I, 
once I once I left after I sold my company and I left uh, the organization, I remember talking to my wife Judy and saying, "Well, what do we want to do now? I'm too young to be to retire." And uh, we decided, you know, there's nothing better than to give back uh, to you know what my grandfather gave to me. And so for me, it's one of these tremendous labors of love that I have the opportunity after talking with my mother, who's the uh, his daughter. Dr. Deming's daughter is the chairman of the institute and the rest of the board that, you know, look, I, I have a background, you know, in business, and I'd love the opportunity to actually run the organization, and I'll volunteer to do it. No, they don't have to pay me anything, the institute. So I do it full full time as a volunteer, and I kind of looked at it as a bit of a startup that the, the, the institute for so many years had done a terrific job of getting uh, the assets of my grandfather, whether it was videos or letters or things like that. But now it was my chance to say, okay, now we can take this in a different direction. We can expand it out. We can have a social network presence. Uh, John Hunter, Mark, who you know, does our blog and our Twitter, and um, and my wife handles, uh, Judy handles the social media. And let's start to expand out. Let's look at this the way my grandfather would have, not just in the short term, but look at it from a Deming organization and expand out and rebrand it, refresh it. Let's let's reinvigorate this message and get it out there and let people know that it is alive and well and that here are some opportunities for you to learn more. Mm -hmm. And so that's been great in working with people like uh, uh, Kelly Allen, who's been um, fantastically instrumental in, in, in my learning, um, and then helping to take the two-and-a-half-day seminar that he had helped design along with a number of other people and redesign that so it was more relevant to what people want today, hmm. that it's not just a lec stand up and lecture, it's interactive. So with that, we've, we've, we've seen interest growing in it, and so we've expanded our programs and our conferences and, and started some new initiatives, including uh, a big initiative in push into education with the help of David Langford. And so, um, you know, that's our opportunity as an organization to, you know, make people's lives better, improve that quality of life. And that's what we're all about as a nonprofit organization. And uh, fortunately, we've had a lot of public support, both financially and from volunteers. And, you know, we continue to need that to to uh, move this organization forward but it's been absolutely exciting as heck to see what we can do what we can achieve um you know with uh you know with this message and with these ideas behind it and now it's just a matter of getting it out there yeah well and it's great to see um all of the activity um like you mentioned uh john uh, john hunter has been a guest on the podcast before um, yes uh, Claire, Claire Crawford Mason has been yep. a guest uh, here before. I, I would encourage people, um, if you want to hear some of those episodes, go to leanpodcast.org, and you, you can find that in the archives. Um, you know, Kevin, I, I really appreciate you um, sharing you know, some of your stories and, and recollections. Um, I, I feel like in a way we're just scratching the surface, but you know, maybe we can do a podcast again uh, in, in the future and, and talk about some of the things the Institute is doing or, you know, reflections that you have, uh, you know, on, 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 you know, what's going on out there, organizations that are using the Deming philosophy, um, you know, it would be good to try to uh, explore that more in the future. Sure. I would love to do that. That would be terrific. I'd, I'd appreciate the opportunity. It's, uh, it's always fun to listen to your podcast, Mark, and, and to have an opportunity to actually uh, participate in one like this. Uh, well, thank you, Kevin. I, I appreciate that. And, you know, I'd encourage everyone to go. Um, the, the Deming Institute website is just Deming.org. Um, would encourage people, um, maybe people hit pause and went and found the, uh, the, uh, the YouTube video. Maybe they are, uh, already watched it. But if you haven't, maybe you're listening to this while you're driving. In that case, I would encourage you not to watch YouTube while you're driving. But um, go go find that video on YouTube, and uh, maybe if there's follow up questions, or you know, we can do uh, another discussion. But again, uh, my guest has been uh, Kevin Cahill. Kevin, thank you so much for taking time to talk today. My pleasure, Mark. I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks for listening. This has been the Lean Blog Podcast. For lean news and commentary updated daily. 
visit www.leanblog.org. If you have any questions or comments about this podcast, email mark at leanpodcast at gmail.com.